give us great insight and understanding. Pray for the kiddos as uh, Pastor Jason just shares with them and teaches them about Passover, uh, that they can ultimately see your great sacrifice that you made for them because of your great love for them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Kiddos, you are dismissed to battleground. I like to think of uh, the Bible as a map. Um, are you able to bring up my Prezi? Uh, I like to think of the Bible as a map. You know, when I think about how maps have changed, uh, I, I, I guess in the early days they were just about like featuring, uh, you know, featuring like major, you know, like, oh, when you see this ridge, then you're going to, you know, head north towards the North Star, and eventually you'll hit the river and follow the river until, you know, you reach the town, you know, and uh, I feel like it's still the way many people would prefer the directions, like, you know, just take a right at the, you know, at the Chili's, you know, the left at that, like, weird store that has, like, a red roof, you know, and we still kind of want to work directions that way, and then as time progressed, our maps got more accurate. We started putting names on roads, and we started actually using like latitudes and longitudes to make precise turns and we could follow a map. I can remember being little, my, my dad was an insurance claims adjuster and so when he was trying to find a, you know, someone's location, he, gets, he has their address and he's like, okay, they live on, you know, such and such lane and he pull open his map of that county and on the left hand side with a list of all the roads. And so he'd look for such and such, such and such, all the way at such and such lane. Okay, that's in grid E8. And so he'd line up E8, he'd find the, the, the road, and then he's like, okay, so here it is. And we'd put his finger there, and then he'd start just drawing a little, he'd take a little highlighter, and he'd highlight, okay, I'm gonna go down 54, I'm gonna, you know, turn uh, on little, I'm gonna turn on ridge, I'm gonna take a left on such and such to get to the road. And so, and then when I was, you know, a little older and there was sometimes I had to go with him, I'd get to be the map guy. I'd get to hold the map. And I'd get to tell him, like, he's like, okay, what's the next turn? Next turn's on little. Okay, how, how far is it? It's like, it's this far. Okay, uh, you, Joe, look at the bottom. What, what is that, a mile? I was like, yeah, it's like a mile. Okay, okay. So it's about a mile. Let me turn it right. All right, and then as maps progressed, then we got, like, map quest. All right, and so I, I'm, I guess maybe... Jason, I can tell you what we used to have to do before we went on trips, maybe Crystal, all right, that I have to, like what we would do is like we'd put in the address and it would just pump out all the instructions for us, but we had to carry those with us. We didn't have it like on a GPS that talked to us on our phones. We had to do this ahead of time, like before you go on a trip, you'd be like, hey, make sure you print out your map quest directions before you go, all right, and you'd print them out and you would just follow along and just be like, yep, in 3.2 miles and you could look at your little odometer to say, okay, 3.2 miles, you'll take a right on little road. Like, okay. And so you had to follow those directions. Well, now we just get it. It just tells us what to do. And you just pick whatever voice, you know, I, I feel like sometimes I pick the voice and it's, and it's uh, the natural voice on there is like this lady. And I just tend to want to say like, no, why am I? Oh, wait, no, I should listen to you. I should turn right when it tells me to. You're not my wife. Okay. I need to listen. <laughs> Uh, I need to listen. The principle of the map is the same. Even though our technology has massively improved, the principle behind the map is exactly the same. We got to listen to it and listen to it exactly. All right, because if we take too many liberties, like it says, I know it says to take right on Little Road. I'm going to take a left on Little Road. It's still Little Road. It's heading you in the opposite direction. A little change from left to right. I don't want to turn right on Little Road. I want to turn right on the next road. I'm going to end up in a completely different spot. So the Bible is this accurate map. But just like all maps, they don't automatically transport us to our destination. We can read about what the Bible says on how we can be spiritually mature. We can read about how we can deepen our relationship with Christ. All right, We can look at how it is on what Christ wants us to live like as a true follower of him. But we don't just arrive there by reading it. It's not like, okay, Phoenix, Arizona, I'm there. All right, we have to now go through and follow the instructions. We got to take the effort, pay the cost, the tolls. All right, we got to take the time to travel there. All right, there, there's no 
fast forward to actually travel to a distant destination. It takes time, it takes perseverance, it takes consistency. All right, and when we look at Scripture, all right, we have to want to get to the destination. And then we've got to follow the directions precisely to get there. We're in the midst of our our series here on the essentials of church. What are the aspects of church that if you take these elements away, that kind of the church falls apart? All right, We, we talked about last week in the idea of fellowship, the importance of fellowshipping with other believers. All right, that this is imperative. If you if you pull out the fellowship with other believers, if you are just gonna say, Yeah, it's me and 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 Jesus. Verse the world. That's all it is. Me and Jesus. You are not, you're not living up to what the church can be by yourself. I, I, I read this great uh, little quote from, I don't, think it's, I don't know if it's an actual quote or someone's just Facebook page and they just came up with something really uh, profound, but I'm sure they're quoting somebody. And it basically says, if, if we let hypocrites, all right, if, if because of hypocrites in the church is the reason why we don't go to church, all right, what we're essentially saying is those hypocrites are closer to God because if a hypocrite can get between us and God understand where you are and where they are. So if we are letting hypocrites get in the way of our relationship with God and filling out his mission of the church, I think we realize that the hypocrites are closer to God than we are. All right, so we aren't going to let anything get in the way of us fulfilling the mission that Christ has in our life. We are going to fellowship with one another, all right, and we are going to be devoted to the scriptures devoted to the scriptures we get this this concept of being devoted to the scriptures from our our theme kind of passage in acts chapter 2 verses 42 through 47 just drawing out the two verses that are specifically applying to devote yourself to scripture they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles teaching and day by day continuing with one mind in the temple so the first thing that we see that scripture does is scripture drives us as believers. It's our food, it's our fuel. All right? If we are, you know, if we are traveling, we either need to have enough, you know, energy, enough little, you know, healthy carbs, whole grains, all right? Enough healthy carbs to be able to make that journey that we're about to take, or we got to have the right enough fuel in our car, all right, to travel wherever we're going. Scripture is that fuel. When we are devote, the reason why they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, this is what was driving their actions. This is what them devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings, what the apostles were writing and sharing and you know explaining to them. This was driving their actions. This was propelling them. It was motivating them to change the things that needed to be changed, to do the things that needed to be done. And then the second thing we see is Scripture is what unites us as believers. So when we look at the concept of fellowship, I hope you can see that if if, if you just get a whole bunch of diverse people in a room together, sit them down, the natural occurrence isn't always going to be unity. Isn't always going to be, hey, we all get along. We just start working together. I think we can clearly see that's not how things usually work you have to have something that unites the group what is it that we're going to try to do together all right and what scripture does is not only is it giving us the purpose like hey what are we trying to do here we're trying to impact this world for the gospel for the kingdom of god we want to grow his kingdom here on this earth so we have this this drive okay but now it's actually uniting us it is teaching us the same thing so even if you know, we come across someone that wasn't in the exact same church as we are in the exact same building. We can be united together because we're all studying the same book. We are all studying the same information. We are all beginning to, we are fighting to understand Jesus, understand God, understand his word, understand his purpose from the same source. And so if we're really reading scripture from the same source, we're going to talk about how we can sometimes deviate, but the Overall, we're going to be really, really close to each other. We're going to be really, really close. And so this is what, the reason why when they're day by day gathering together in the temple, what what allowed them to have one mind, 
all right, is that they realize their unity in Christ. They realize the unity in his will. Uh, I'm going to share that i got a couple quotes for you throughout uh, the sermon. Here's a great one uh, from the great George Mueller. He says, It is a common temptation of Satan to make us give up the reading of the word when our enjoyment is gone. As if it were no use to read the scriptures when we do not enjoy them. The truth is that in order to enjoy the word, we ought to continue to read it. The less we read the word of God, the less we desire to read it. All right, so if we have these statements of just like, it's just so hard, it's just, I don't really enjoy it. The the first answer is it doesn't matter if you enjoy it. It doesn't matter if you enjoy it. There are things we do because we know it's good and right and healthy. I don't think anybody says, like, I really love just brushing my teeth. All right? we, we do it because we know its value. We know its importance overall. We understand the value it creates in our interpersonal relationships. All right? we, there are plenty of things that we do regularly that we don't, there's not like a quote-unquote enjoyment factor. All right? But I, I, it's not abandoning the idea that you can enjoy Scripture. I think the people that say they don't enjoy Scripture are the ones that aren't reading the Scriptures. They they think back and they remember, and it is something, when I I think the tool of Satan, what I think the kind of demonic presence in this world can do is help us remember all the good things about the sinful things we used to do, and we forget the consequences. And then all the good things we used to do, we forget how good and pleasurable and enjoyable the good things we do is, and we only remember the mundane. All right? So if we are actually doing what we know to do is right, and we're reading the scriptures, we will enjoy it more. We will enjoy it. And when we are reading it less, we will enjoy it less. All right? And as we read the scriptures, we have two options going into the scriptures. We can either... Let the scriptures change us, or we are going to change the scriptures. So if we engage the Bible, there's going to be one of two things that we do when we read it. We're either going to let it change us, or we're going to start changing it. I'll show you what I mean. So the first thing is let let scripture change you. Uh, I I brought up this passage a couple weeks ago. Now we get to dig into it a little bit more. James chapter 1, verse 22, but prove yourself doers of of the word. James is this ultimately practical book. It's not building strong theology. It is simply just a a pragmatic, practical, just do it, guys. Do this. Watch out for this. Do this. So he says, prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. So there's a couple things here. The Pharisees read the scriptures daily. They memorized it you know what this seems like crazy to us that like you know like what you're talking about people like memorize the whole old testament uh yeah there's actually a lot of people throughout history that have memorized the entire bible that was the pharisaical position that is what they were working on they were memorizing whole chunks of scripture there were pharisees that had memorized the entire old testament all right and if if they had memorized the entire old testament there was they at least had you know, a certain thing. They knew all the Psalms or all the, uh, the, the Torah is usually what you work on first, the first five books. I mean, they had this stuff memorized, but they weren't changed by it. They obviously weren't changed by it. They didn't even recognize Jesus. So we know the same is possible for us. It's easy to look at the Pharisees. They're the villains of the story. I'm the hero of my story. And, and we, we forget, I think, the reason why I think the Pharisees make for a, a great villain <laughs> in the story is that I hope you don't think that you're, you know, you're Jesus. You're the disciples that are always agreeing with Jesus, and we, don't, we never see the disciples always agreeing with Jesus. 
I, I think the reason why that Matthew and Mark and Luke and John kept bringing up the Pharisees is because I think they realized that most of us are going to fall into those dangers, that we are going to church, that we are reading the Bible, that we are praying and that we do it ritualistically, and that we, are, we can very quickly and easily get to the point where we just do stuff and aren't changed by it, that we can do all the spiritual things that we are supposed to do and literally miss Jesus. That's what the Pharisees did. They missed Jesus, and it's possible for us to read the Bible, not be changed, and miss Jesus while we're reading it. So the concept of the mirror implies changes in three stages. There's three stages that imply change in the reading of Scripture. So number one, the onset. The reason why, we'll, we'll stick with it, but the reason why we look into a mirror, the reason why your bathroom, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to predict the future here. In your bathroom, there's a mirror over the sink. So who did I get right? There's a mirror over your sink in the bathroom. Does anybody have a bathroom without a sink? Nobody has a bathroom without a sink. I can remember going to like a public school, uh, well, it was a private school. I, I, we was doing some little competition thing. We went to the bathrooms and there was no mirror in there. It's such a weird look, like the washer hands are like, what is going on here? This is awkward. This is strange. Or worse, they have like just the, the shiny piece of metal that you're like, is this what I really look like? Am I like a distorted elephant man person? All right, you know, like you have these, you know, you, it's weird. It's weird not to see a mirror. This is the moments that we take. It's why we want the mirror in our bathroom is because we want to take a look at it and see, am I ready? Am I ready to see other human beings? All right, am I prepared to enter this world? All right, so at the onset, why we look into the mirror, the reason why we look into the mirror is we are at least somewhat mentally prepared to wipe a little schmutz, all right, to, to, to get a little water and, and rinse. We are prepared to change if we're willing to look into the mirror. So hopefully at the onset of reading the scriptures, it's with the mindset of at least hypothetically speaking, I'm willing to change. At least, hypothetically speaking, I'm, I, I, I'm willing to change if there's something blaring and obvious. All right, so that is where <coughs> it starts. Are we willing, the first set of changes, are we even willing to read the Bible saying that I'm willing to change? The second stage of change is at the revelation. So in the thinking about the mirror, there's, I looked up in the mirror to kind of see, am I ready? And I am. Uh, now I see the problem. Uh-oh. I, I, got, I got like weird scruff and it looks like homeless scruff, not like I'm, I'm cool, like a, you know, uh, like I'm a cool, you know, five o'clock shadow. It just looks awkward. Or I got the stain. I got this. Oh, I didn't do my hair yet. All right. Like I could be rushing so much that I'll look in the mirror. I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> All right, done. All right. <laughs> it falls like this. Really just put it out and it falls right over. Uh, so... What, when you see that there's a problem, this takes more work. It, it's, a, it, it's very simple to look in the mirror. The more work is when you see that there's a problem, am I going to do something to change? All right, I, I put on a shirt the other day, and I, I was evaluating the stain I was looking at. There were like three little stains. I'm like, I don't think that's going to wash out. I think that could be from chicken wing juice. I think that's not going to just wash out. I think I need to go put that in the laundry again. So I had to make the decision, I'm going to change shirts, I'm going to get a new shirt. That is obviously more work than just looking up into the mirror. It obviously takes more work than just the, the willingness to, to take a look, is there anything wrong? Now i got to change the shirt. Scripture works the same way. It's, it's, it's easy at the onset to say, yeah, let me read God's Word, see what God has for me. It's when we start seeing that like, so I guess I shouldn't be doing that anymore. I guess the way I was treating that person isn't exactly the way Jesus would have treated them. I guess this person I'm thinking about, I'm really thinking about what God wants. He wants me to love them. What would loving them actually look like? Uh, as I evaluate, this is the harder part. This is the more challenging to actually change. 
that's the more difficult opportunity to change. But now the third piece of change comes. We, we made the decision, I want to read the scripture to see what God has for my life. Good motive. I then see an area I need to change, and I actually started changing it. The third area that changes is what actually happens, uh, I guess I shouldn't say naturally, but supernaturally. The supernatural cha change that happens with us is we start changing the way we see things. Once we have changed, the world changes around us. All right? People, the things that people were doing in our life can suddenly start to bother us. Shows that we were watching can suddenly begin to grind us in a different way. We're hearing them with new ears. A simple illustration. I remember when I was a, a kid, uh, uh, young. Like it's so funny. It's one of my earlier memories. I remember my dad bringing me over to little, this lake park, and uh, there were like the monster trucks were there. And there was a big, giant grave digger. And I can remember when you're two, two and a half years old, I think, that's a building. Like those trucks are the size of buildings. And it's just, you, you can't even imagine the size of this thing. It, it's just once you get older and then you come across Gravedigger again and you walk up to it, it's big. It's big. It's not a building. You know, like your head's coming up to the floorboard like, oh, okay, you climb up the stairs, you get in. It's still like a normal size seat up there and a normal size wheel and a normal, it's really a normal size truck with giant tires. All right? And you're like, it doesn't seem as big anymore. It's not because Grave Digger got smaller. It's because I got bigger. And so as I get bigger, things that seemed really big are obviously now much smaller. And so when we are changed by Jesus, everything in this world begins to change. I've heard people talk about it. It's like a telescope that, you know, it's, it's not just if we look through the telescope we see the world beyond, all right? We're, we're, it's, we're not trying to even see, like, you know, I love the, when you've seen that maybe thing on the internet and stuff, like, we, we face the Hubble Space Telescope into, like, a, a black spot in space, but when we aimed it there and took a picture, all of a sudden, we could see behind it, we could see hundreds of galaxies, not stars, other galaxies, all right? And we, there are galaxies on top of galaxies on top of galaxies, so it, it's not that we just see what a telescope is like. It's like a microscope. It's not seeing something smaller. It's seeing something beyond what we could naturally see. It's seeing something beyond what our eyes could ever hope to see. And that's what I think is happening when we read Scripture. We start seeing the spiritual implications behind everything. We start seeing the world beyond this world. A and we start seeing the intricate work that God is doing for his kingdom and the role we get to play in the midst of this. But I think you're going to see when this is like this little ideal situation. We go into scripture wanting it to change us. We then see a problem in ourselves. We see a sin or something we're not doing and we change and then our life is changed. So I think we see the problem in this is that the problem comes in when we reject the Bible. Now, men don't reject the Bible because it contradicts itself. That's what people tend to claim. Like, ah, you know, the Bible's kind of all over the place. It says something different everywhere. You know, you can't, it's just written by men. Like, what's, how can people really know? Pe men do not reject the Bible because it contradicts itself, but because it contradicts them. All right? It, it is going to rub against your lifestyle the right way. It's, it's the bumpers, you know, when you... Um, when you're not good at bowling, you have to put up the bumpers. And even my kids need the bumpers. But, you know, I'll, I'll keep them up for my turn, too. You know, I'll keep them up for my turn. I want to bowl like a 130, you know. And so the way to do that is with bumpers. If you think that you are going to open up Scripture and you are just right down the center lane every time, uh-uh. You, you, hey, your Scripture reading today might do that and tomorrow, but by Wednesday or Thursday, you're going to read something. You're like, okay, that's a good Look, that I, I am rubbing up against the edge. All right, I fell asleep and I am scraping uh, the little silver things on the side that I'm thankful are actually there. I have maybe scraped them once. All right, that are maybe actually there to keep you from careening off the top of the highway. There are going to be aspects of Scripture that rub against your life. 
All right? Even if you, the person with the best motives and the best goals and so moral, any, any kind of time, you're going to realize there's a spot or two that you're, you're getting off, that you're not dead center of what Christ wants you to. And, and, and we use this illustration when you're thinking about navigating, like the open seas, you know, a degree off, you know, over a couple hours doesn't make a big deal. A degree off over a few days or a few weeks, you can end up in a different continent, all right? I mean, you, when you are a degree off, that starts multiplying, 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 multiplying. All right, when we get a little off, the point of Scripture is it, it, it reproofs us, all right? It gets us back on track. Obedience to Scripture is what changes us, and if we don't change, we must be changing it. 2 Timothy uh, 2.14, remind, remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of God. This is, if you ever did Awanas in school, this is the Awana verse. Approved workmen are not ashamed. A-W-A-N-A, Awana. All right, what, what this is saying here is when we, do, we shouldn't be involved at the twisting of words and the argumentation because when we start doing that, what we are always going to do is try to align the Bible with our point of view. To go back to the, um, you know, to go back to the bowling illustration, if you have a, a terrible hook, all right, in your game, all right, option one is learn to straighten it out so that it stays inside the lane, or option two, build a new lane that actually curves outward with your, um, you know, with your, with your curve. Same thing for golf. If you're like, man, I'm slicing it every time, it'd be so much easier if this thing was just dog leg to the left. Are we going to change the course to fit our swing? Are we going to change the... Uh, the bowling alley to fit our our curve or are we going to learn that this is the rules of the game this is the barriers that god has created and i need to fall inside of it are we going to be diligent to presenting yourselves approved to god as workmen who do not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth so there's two ways that we don't accurately handle the bible the two ways that we predominantly don't handle the Bible well. So number one, the way we don't handle the Bible well is we don't want to change. We like our life and usually sin more than we want God and his will for our life. So we don't like it. So when, to get down to the nitty gritty of that, the way I, I, I want to think about it is when you open up the scriptures, we're either going to obey it or we're not, but it's not... Honestly, it's not always that simple. Let me, especially when we deal with like the Old Testament. When we open up the Bible and we'll, we'll see like a list of things, and it'll say things like, you know, love your neighbor, don't lie, don't commit homosexual acts, don't wear two different kinds of fabric at the same time, don't eat bacon or any other delicious unclean animals. Like when we are reading scripture like, you know, like this, and we're like, okay, this seems really plain and simple. Um, what we tend to do is we tend to go through that list and say, okay, well, love your neighbor, I agree with that, so that one stays in. And don't lie, I agree with that, that one stays in. Uh, don't commit homosexual acts, and people are either like, yeah, yeah, that's something I don't struggle with, so I'm fine with that one on being on there. And some people are like, oh, man, maybe that seems complicated. Maybe we could do all that. Oh, but the two kinds of clothing... I like the shirt. It's got polyester. So therefore, I think that's a stupid one. And the eat bacon, you know, not eat bacon, like not eating unclean animals, I have to eat kosher all the time. That doesn't seem, um, that seems, you know, like I, I don't think I like that one. And I see other Christians do it, so it must be fine. And if other Christians are doing it, they must know have a good reason why they don't do that. Uh, this is a long discussion, uh, but let me try to make it simple. Uh, when it comes to interpreting scripture, one thing that makes Christianity unique is that we don't, we don't hold one Bible truths like great, like we don't say, well, you know, Paul is number one, so his writings take the first front, and then it goes down to the sending order. We don't say that the New Testament is more 
inspired Word of God in the Old Testament. The whole Bible, start to finish, is all equal. However, from an understanding standpoint, it's the easiest for us to understand the epistles. And the reason why is, it was written to the church. They're written to Christians. And so when it states these things, it's really easy to read and understand what it's saying because it's, it's literally written to the church. All right? It's easier for us to understand. And so it would be easy to see in the epistles, there's very clear statements of loving your neighbor as yourself. There's very clearly not, being, not lying and not bearing false witness, things like that. It also is clear on the area of homosexual acts. All right? It doesn't bring up wearing two different kinds of fabrics. And it does bring up the reason why Christians are free to eat what was once called an unclean animal. We are free, we do have the freedom to eat anything. And that brings us to kind of the thing number two that will help us. Jesus is transitioning the physical laws of the Old Testament into spiritual laws in this new covenant. So as the new covenant takes place, there's an old covenant where we would call the Mosaic law. Uh, that's this older covenant. There's covenants older than that, like the Abrahamic covenant. But the Mosaic law is a covenant, but we're not under that covenant. As believers, as followers of Jesus, as Christians, as Gentiles, we are under this new covenant. And Jesus is transitioning the very physical laws of the Old Testament into very spiritual laws. He's not making them easier. All right? He's actually, in many ways you can see, he's actually making them much harder. All right? But it's spiritual. For instance, Jesus says, you might have heard it said, don't commit adultery. But what I say to you, don't even lust after a woman. You've committed adultery in your heart already. You've heard it said, do not murder. But I say to you, do not even hate your brother, for you have committed murder in your heart already. So he's taking things where people were saying, yeah, I've, I've fulfilled this part of the law. I haven't murdered anybody. I haven't committed adultery. And he says, yes, you have. You have if you're lusting. You have if you've hated. All right? You have broken the law. And that God's expectations is in this spiritual realm that even our motives matter. That our motives, even if we don't kill the person, but we are wishing them dead. All right? He says, you, you've got hate in your heart. You're, you're going to be consumed by that. So God, in many ways, made it harder, but we see a transition from this physical obedience to this spiritual fulfillment. And then when we get down to the Old Testament laws that were there for the Israelites as a preparation for Christ's coming, it talks about in Galatians how the law was a tutor. It was meant to prepare us for this test that was Jesus. The most important question in the world, what are you going to do with Jesus Christ? The most important question in the world, are you going to believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the dead? That the law was all about preparing the hearts of the Israelites to be ready to believe in the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. And he also sets a standard of perfection that we all would fail. Where God is, where we, we talked about this Leviticus video, God is giving, here are the requirements in order to even be able to be in my presence for a short period of time. Even the Day of Atonement could only last a year. And you have to continually bring this in order to be in God's presence. He's setting this standard that we are all just falling short of. And then he shows, here's my grace, a sacrifice, to cover over where you've fallen short. So everything is about understanding that we need a Savior. And we are not Israel. We are not a nation uh, of Israel under God following these laws that were designed for a particular people for a particular group of time. He has put us under a new covenant. And that doesn't mean we ignore everything that is said in the Old Testament. By no means. We actually see how God operates and how God is faithful inside of his covenant that he has made with people so that we can then apply that to the New Testament, where we don't get to read exactly how it is. You are promised heaven without ever getting to see heaven. If you believe you are going to heaven, it's because you believe that God is going to keep his promise. And the reason why you believe God's going to keep his promises is that you've heard story after story after story in Sunday school and church on how God made a promise and kept a promise. 
all throughout the Old Testament. So our, the, the, what we get to stand on in these New Testament promises of heaven and eternal life and getting to p- be partakers in uh, the kingdom of God, what we are holding on to is the promises that we saw God fulfill in the Old Testament. So it's extraordinarily valuable. But here's the key. When we see something in Scripture and we are, you know, using like eating unclean animals is a great example. We see a lot of Old Testament laws about what not to eat, and yet we eat those things, all right? And if we are eating those things, why? It can't just be because, because I like it, I want to. It can't be because I see other Christians do it. They're doing it, why can't I? That can't be the reason. The reason needs to be, am I going to be humble enough to dig into why this might not be as clear as it seems, why is it, if I see others doing it, and I, it rubs against, I, I kind of feel like, you know, I've been praying, this doesn't seem like something that God has set off in the Old Testament. Can I be humble enough to say, I need to make sure there's an answer here, because I'm willing to not eat this. I'm willing to inconvenience every aspect of my life. I'm willing to do whatever it says here. I just want to make sure I'm accurately interpreting it, and I go in and I dig into the Scriptures, and I find the answer to what Scripture says. Why has he released me? to being able to eat whatever I want? Why has he released me into being able to wear things that are made with two different kinds of fabrics? Why has he released me in that? And the answer is he has released you. He wants you to know what the original rule was, and then he wants you to see the freedom you now have in Christ. And we should praise God when we read some of these Old Testament laws. They should be appraising, like, thank you, for not putting me under that burden, Lord. There should be a praise, but instead, we just shake it off and say, eh, I'm not doing that. I'm sure there's a reason why I don't do it. <laughs> All right? We, we've got, to, the, the motive behind that is Scripture actually the forefront. Are we willing to study it enough to be able to figure out why I can do what God gives me the freedom to do? But even really moral people can struggle with the second one. So I said the first reason why people ignore Scripture is they don't want to change. They like the way they live their lives. And I think you're going to find overwhelmingly the things that really rub us the wrong way are going to be things that are reiterated in the New Testament, that are reiterated very clearly in the epistles to not be this and don't be this. And there is no, there is no inheritance in the kingdom of God for this long list of sins. I think if you're being honest, you are struggling with at times. But the second reason I think could be more insidious, the other reason we don't change when reading Scripture is that we want the attention. We want to be in control. And what Scripture is clear at is that Jesus gets all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, and that he's in control, not me. And a lot of sin is not sin because it's a, you can't do this. It's a, No, you've got to wait on God's timing for this. You don't get to have control over this. We want the attention. We want the control. And Scripture is all about Jesus. And when we manipulate it, we can make it all about us. Here's a quote from Martin Luther that I think is a really powerful one. It says, God is everywhere. However, he does not want you to reach out for him everywhere, but only in the word. Reach out for it, and you will grasp him aright. Otherwise, you are tempting God and setting up idolatry. This is why he has established a certain method for us. This teaches us how and where we are to look for him and find him, namely, in the Word. So what happens is we we love God, we love Jesus, And we want to interact with Jesus on our own terms, in our own way. And we want to honor him the way we want to honor him. We want to praise him the way we want to praise him. And so we relegate Jesus to worshiping him in our timing and in our way. And God has said, I think Martin Luther brings it out really good, this is idolatry. What we are doing is, if we are writing the terms of our relationship with God, then it's not him writing the terms for us. Where we engage Jesus, where we find Jesus, where we interact with him is in the scriptures. This is where we get to do this. 
and everything else, when we start, the first thing that we're going to see start going is we start basically creating our own Jesus. We're going to keep naming him Jesus because we love Jesus. So we're going to keep the name, and then we're just going to manipulate everything else about what Jesus wants for our life and how he wants to help me and what he wants to do for me, for me, for me, for me. And I put myself as the central character, and Jesus becomes the supporting character in my life. And when I want a relationship with him on my own terms, apart from Scripture, I am changing. I am changing the Scriptures to fit me. All right? And Scripture, one thing that it won't let you do while reading it, is uh, unless you manipulate it, unless you aren't accurately handling it, you can realize, man, it has nothing to do with you. <laughs> it has nothing to do with helping you. It has not, I shouldn't say nothing, but it's, it's definitely not the central point, is to help you and to make you stronger and to empower you. It is, ev- it is it's just a total shift of thinking. You're serving Christ. You're going to honor and glorify him. You get to serve him. Yes, there's some great benefits, great blessing, as it says back, uh, you know, what we says back here in this verse here, the man is blessed in all he does. There is a blessing in that. But we don't then get to reinterpret what that blessing means. That blessing means I get to be... Blessing is just, man, this is God's presence with me. God gets to be with me everywhere I go. What a blessing that is. And we, we've turned the Bible into self-help, self-empowerment, self-centered uh, this. We can't go into Scripture saying, I'm going to do this so I have a good day. All right? And I think early on, young believers do this a lot. We read the Bible because when we do it, I, I have a good day when I read the Bible, and I have a stressful day when I don't read the Bible. I promise you the day is coming where the, every day you read the Bible, it's going to be a bad day. All right? And it's because you start having opportunities to live it out, and it's actually really hard to live out the scriptures in our everyday life. And so you start having bad days. And so then you start saying, okay, I'll, I'm, I'm Pavlov's dog, that's fine. If I'm going to have a bad day, I'm not going to read the Bible. And you don't read the Bible, and you have a good day. All right? And then we, ha- we don't read the Bible a second, and we have another good day. All right? And if we're going to start evaluating, and basically our deal with God is, here's my deal. I read your Bible, you give me a good day. Sound good? All right? Do we got a deal? All right? You know, like, are we threatening God? Like, why are we doing this? Is it all about us, or is it all about God? And I think if you really read the Scriptures, not trying to manipulate, you're going to get this overwhelming, uh, the overwhelming point that it's all about Jesus. So here's this application. Uh-oh, I already misspelled the second word up there. Read it. Read it personally. Read it personally. This should be something that's regularly a part of your life. Again, don't, this isn't, we don't, we're not going to be pharisaical about this and like, oh, what, what happens if I miss the Bible reading today? It's just fine. It should just be a regular part of your life. It should just be a regular part of your life. Things happen. There's the crazy day and the crazy moment. God isn't a punishing God like, you know, oh man, you, you wake up at a call in the middle of the night and there was some kind of emergency and you're running around all day, you overslept your alarm and you, run, and you didn't have time to read the Bible. Like, oh, did I have a bad day because I didn't read the Bible that day? Like, no, no, God isn't, it's not how God thinks and not how God operates. He just wants you to know him. He wants you to talk to him all the time. We wants to, he wants us to hear from him. And we, the way we hear from him is by reading God's word. You know, if, if the statement of if you haven't heard God speak to you recently, uh, it might be because you haven't read the Bible. And if you are wanting God to speak to you apart from reading the Bible, all right, it, the answer is, you know, he is speaking, you're just not listening, apparently. Because this is how he communicates to us. So read it personally. It should be something just a regular part of your life. It's something we want, the reason why I've wanted to, like, these last couple months, let's do a Bible reading together. Anything I can do to just help encourage you, and it helps encourage me, I'm not going to be the one that misses a day. All right? <laughs> because I, I want to be this good example. And I want to enjoy this along with you. I want you to see that it's enjoyable. I want it to become a a habit in your life, something you do regularly. So number one, read it personally. Number two, study it diligently. This isn't a check, this isn't a checkbox. There's nothing in Christianity that is this like, you know, this little checkbox like, went to church, 
prayed, read the Bible, done. No, everything is about the, the study it is, yeah, no, I, I really want to understand this. I really want to know what it means. We can, you know, you can read the same, you can read something 15 times, and then all of a sudden a connection was made with something else you read, and you start digging in deeper, and you start reading what other people have to say about it to help you understand what Scripture is saying a little bit deeper when you actually start saying, like, am I really living this out? I want you to study it. I want you to really seek to understand it and comprehend it. And it takes work to do that. It, it doesn't come very quickly. And this, the, there's waves to this. There's plenty of times I'm just reading and reading, and then all of a sudden I start digging in. What I tell, one of the things I tell my preachers, um, they're starting to preach their first sermon here. They got their introductions uh, due on Monday. I have my, four, my four preachers, I have three guys and one girl this year. And as they are preparing their sermons, the thing I always tell them, and I said, hey, you need to research your passage. You need to dig in the commentaries because you don't know what you don't know. There's plenty of times that I read something and I'm like, seems pretty straightforward, I'll just say it. Then when I start reading some commentaries, I start realizing like, oh, there's something tricky in here. I didn't even realize it was tricky. Maybe it was just like, I didn't think about it that way. Or there's like a complicated, like the, the Greek phrasing is complicated here and there's a couple different interpretations that could potentially be. I don't know what I don't know, and this is when I actually start studying Scripture, and I start really fighting to understand it, because I know God wants me to understand it. He didn't write something that's purposely, ooh, this is going to be purposely veiled till a later time. He wants me to understand the Scriptures. He's not hiding anything from me. All right? And it's meant to be understood. And so as I start reading this, he's not trying to hide anything. There's nothing secret in here. It's meant to be understood. I want to understand it, and I want to fight to understand it. And this last piece is pass it continually. By passing it along, it helps us understand whatever you learn that day in Scripture, start saying is, okay, yes, this was for me, and it's for someone else. Who, how can I actually live this out today? How can I actually share this with someone today? How can I actually talk with somebody? Now, the ultimate goal of this is discipleship. That when we talk about discipling other people, it's as I am learning something in Scripture, that's what I'm going to share with somebody else. I'm going to share with them whatever it is I learned. I can't share things I don't know. So I'm reading it, I'm studying it, so that I can pass stuff along. And the goal that God has in you learning this stuff is not just for you. It's for you to pass on to your children. That's the easy part to pass on to your children, all right, in the way you act, the way you live, the way you talk. It's you to pass on to your friends and family. It's yours to pass on to whoever you might be discipling or will be discipling. It's something we get to pass on. All right, so when we read the scriptures, again, don't immediately jump to, who's this for? It's for you first, right? And we don't get to just read the Bible and like, ugh, I wish my wife would have read this. All right, we get to read scripture and say, it's for me. I want to make sure I understand. I want to make sure I'm living it. All right? And I want to pass it. I want to pass it along to someone. This is where the church comes into play. All right? That what we get to do here together, all right? what we get to do is I get to challenge you, encourage you to read God's Word on your own. I hope as I'm reading the Scriptures and talking about it and you know, looking at it and always fighting for what does it mean to the original hearers. That's what we mean by expository preaching, is that we are fighting to understand our, our, the main idea of my sermons is the main idea of the passage that we're reading. I, I want you to see that it's easy to understand. Hopefully maybe I could teach you a couple things along the way that will help you understand Scripture as you go. That's what we're doing. We're studying it. And then now it's, are we going to share it? I, I can only share this with those in here, those that are, you know, watching online, and people in my life. But when we start thinking about you all sharing it, now we start multiplying. All right, it, it gets exponential real quick, that we're not just doing addition. It's not just my people plus your people. It's my people plus your people, and if your people are sharing it to their people, uh, it starts getting infinitely big, and the kingdom of God can actually grow and spread. And it all starts with us understanding who Christ is, what he's done for us, and what he wants us to do in our life. Let's pray together. Uh, 
Jesus, I think of several requests um, that uh, have been shared this morning. I think of uh, Ray's uh, mom and just uh, getting some tests done for kind of some blurry vision stuff and just praying. It's nothing more serious, uh, some kind of tumor or anything like that. We pray um, for quick healing. We pray for doctor's wisdom. Uh, in the midst of that, we pray for Becky's friend, Josh, uh, in dealing with COVID. And a little bit good report. Um, hopefully that continues. Um, we pray for uh, Vanessa, uh, dealing with some health, um, uh, dealing with some health challenges. We just uh, and pray for her daughter as well, just an unspoken uh, request. I pray for any other issues that people are having. I heard just some of the kids this morning sharing some travel and safety and whatnot. Uh, but God, I pray that uh, what we can begin today, as we open up the scriptures, as we are seeking it because we, we, want, we want to know what you have for our life. We want to be more like you. We want to change. I pray when we actually are confronted, as you reveal to us in our hearts and our life, that, okay, I'm not really living up to this. This is not actually how I'm acting all the time. This is not, uh, I'm not displaying great Christ-like character in this area. I pray as those are revealed to us that we do the difficult thing and begin to change. We apologize where we need to apologize. We, uh, we, we live differently the way we need to live differently. That we cut out things that need to be cut out. That we are humble enough to go into scriptures and saying, I'm not here to dictate what this means. I need to make sure I really understand what it means. And if there's going to be something that, man, scripture kind of seems to say this, and if I'm not going to do it, I need to know a clear reason from scripture why I'm not doing Because I want to be faithful to your word, God. And I want to begin to share this truths with others. Give me opportunity. Give me more people that I can share this with in my life. That I'm quick to share the things I've been reading in Scripture. Quick to share the things I'm learning about you. The things I'm excited about. Let me begin to do that. And that we as a church can really begin to affect our little concentric circles of concern. Our, our, our friends, our neighbors, our family. That we can start impacting them with the truths of your word, for your honor, for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen and amen. God bless. Um, keep an eye. we got all those different things coming up in just a couple weeks. You